Father, that's what we pray this morning. God, that you would just reveal yourself and I got as, as uniquely as you have created us and as uniquely in our circumstances as we come into uh, the different campuses or online, wherever we are. God, we pray that in that uniqueness, you would speak a unique word to each of us. Uh, we love you. We pray these things in your perfect son's name. And everybody said, amen. Well, hey, if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, which is very likely because across all of our campuses and here at Lincoln Road, there are lots of you. Uh, my name's Gray, and I get to hang out over at the Hunt Club, and I'm thrilled to be with you in, in this series, Are We There Yet?, uh, because it has allowed me to, to kind of go down memory lane a little bit. A couple weeks ago, uh, Craig Curtis, he talked about how this, that phrase, are we there yet, that question um, makes him think about vacations in his family's station wagon growing up. And, uh, and so as soon as he said that, man, immediately I went back to my childhood. And we didn't have a station wagon. We had, we had a 1985 navy blue Buick LeSabre, okay? Now, LeSabre is Buick for the sword, okay? So uh, if you don't know what a Buick LeSabre is, just imagine an iron rectangle on wheels. This thing had a V8 in it, and, man, it was a Sherman tank. And I felt like we took that thing all over the country. I've got two older brothers, one five years older and one seven years older. And so in those years growing up, I was, you know, real little and, and I was always stuck in the back seat in the middle with these two ogres on either side, you know, like all the way to Washington, D.C. And, um, and so that was, that was, you know, I started thinking about the, the La Sabra and, uh, but then and I was thinking about as a, as a dad, like in our, in our own family. And I'll, I'll just be honest, guys, this list continues to grow. Like even this morning, I was reminded of, of this, but I, I was thinking about some trips that we've taken, and I had an epiphany in all of these trips growing up and then even as, as a parent is, is that vacations rarely go as planned. Now, you, you may be like the planner, and you're like, oh, no, it's going to go as planned. And, and you may be right, but people probably aren't going to have fun um, that was extra. But, but for, for most of us, we're like, man, we make plans and we're, we're going and we're going to do and, and then things just, just don't work out I, I, the way we wanted it to. I was reminded of a trip that we took, it, you know, it was just going to be a day trip. So it was like Gilligan's Island, a three hour tour. And, and uh, it was just going to go down to New Orleans two hours from where we lived at the time. And we we're going to go to the zoo. Our son was around four years old at the time, never been to the New Orleans Zoo, go to the aquarium, you know, eat some beignets, that kind of thing. And and it, it, was, it was a terrible, terrible trip. I and mean, when we get down there, apparently uh, the zoo closes on random days. And didn't know that uh, until we were the only ones in the parking lot. And, and so that was, a, you know, trying to explain that to our child. Um, and, we, you know, of course, we blamed it on the zoo. I don't know what these people are thinking. Uh, of course we checked. And, uh, but then... Uh, then we'll go to the aquarium, and we had been talking about sharks. So he was kind of into that. And I want to say maybe it was around Shark Week with the Discovery Channel, and we're excited to see the sharks. And um, it was a little underwhelmed by most of the things at the aquarium, so we were putting a lot of stock in the shark exhibit. And so we go in there, and it turns out that uh, real sharks are frightening um, uh, for four-year-olds. And... and, and <laughs> And that didn't go well. And we're like, holly. And so then we're like, you know, get some beignets. That did go well. Go head home. And uh, on the way home, uh, my, my water pump on my, my truck started going out. And, and so it would start overheating. And so we'd have to stop and let it cool down. We'd have to stop. I think we spent like $200 on, on radiator fluid on the way home. And, and somewhere between, uh, so it took us like four and a half hours to get home. Somewhere between like after Pastagoula and the, the Alabama state line, uh, at around 9.50, 9.45 at night, we had to pull over, and it was like, it's this, I can't go any further, I'm going to blow the motor up. And, of course, you know, the, where we pulled over, there were no immediate gas stations. In fact, you, you know, fully expected to hear banjos playing. Um, and, and so, I, I, you know, get on the phone, sure enough, there's one about a mile away, it closes at 10 o'clock. Baby, I got this. I'm going to run. 
buy some radiator fluid because we couldn't, we couldn't drive there fast enough because it kept overheating. And, and so I did. Uh, so I left, I left my four-year-old and my wife in the middle of podunk nowhere and uh, with, with a flashlight and a pocket knife. And like this is the stuff that that used to that I used to watch growing up on Unsolved Mysteries, you know. And the husband's like, "I swear I didn't do it. Like I didn't do it, you know, like that." I was like, "This is here we go." And as I, you know, I run down, I get there, and even the the, uh, the people at the, the gas station are like, "How'd you get here?" I was like, "I ran." And and like, why? Well, we're broke down, and you know, they gave me a ride back, and and as like, we we didn't go to New Orleans for another three years. We're like, I'm just done with New Orleans, you know. And then, again, the list started building. I was like, there was, then that same year, our poor son, we decided to take him. He's five now, uh, had a, has a broken arm, uh, and we went to Uganda. We went to Africa, and, and we put a lot of thought into the plane trip, 14-hour plane trip, and, but we didn't think about a whole lot about the time change once we got there, and that son of a gun never did adjust, and so we would be out cold, and he's just up watching, you know, uh, a cartoon on the, iPod, on the iPad because he never, like, man, we, I didn't go the way we planned, and I didn't think about that, you know, and so then he's, you know, not in a great mood the rest of the day, um, but, but I would imagine that if we sat down, that you've got some stories, and you could be like, yeah, man, I, I did, totally didn't see that coming, or I just dropped the ball on that, and, and that's the way vacations are, you know, but it's also the same way our life and faith are. And I really kind of think about those as, as one, that, 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 that our faith and in, in, in our life, that we, we strike a trail and we're ready and we think we got it all laid out and everything's going to work just like we want it to. And then, and then we get distracted. I don't know if you, if you have shiny rock syndrome, but, uh, but, but I do. And we live in a world that makes billions of dollars off of us having shiny rock syndrome. And so, you know, we've got this plan of what we want to do for God and, and even what we want God to do in our life. And we get distracted and we, we start wandering over here and it may be not even like something bad. I'm not necessarily talking about sin. It can be sin, but we, we get distracted. Oftentimes it's the urgent things that, that distract us from the important things. And, and, and we start wandering this way and, and, and then we, you know, you chase enough rabbits and, and get distracted enough. You, you look around you look around and you're lost. Now, man, how, how did I get here? You get disoriented. Or maybe, maybe you've been there in your faith where maybe you would say, well, I'm pretty distracted right now. Like this is just checking a box for me. Or, or, or maybe you've been distracted so long that, that you are just disoriented. You're like, man, I don't even know, where, I don't, I don't know how to get back. I don't know how I got here. You know, like, we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, there was a, years ago, I was on a trip with a bunch of guys that I'd never met before. We were on a three-week trek in the mountains of New Mexico, and, and we were trying to get to a campsite, and, and we heard the voices, and so we thought we would just get off the trail and go straight there. It was a terrible idea. And, and as we got to talking and we're walking down this, this boulder field, at some point we realized, like after an hour, like, hey, we should be here by now. And we stop and listen, and we can't hear the voices we were walking towards anymore. We spent that night on the side of a mountain because we had been just so distracted and not paying attention that, that, that we had we'd just gotten disoriented and we'd gotten lost. But, but if, if you stay lost long enough, I know it's hard to get lost in our day and time now with our phones in our hands, but you can get discouraged. Start asking questions about God. Like, hey, God, do you, like, do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you see what's going on around me? And, and I'm, I'm explaining these as if they are sequential, like you get distracted, you, um, you get disoriented, you get discouraged. But man, they can all happen in isolation in and of themselves, especially discouragement. Because this world, and, and you probably have lived long enough to know this, th this world promises us two things. Number one, you're going to die, okay? The, the average death rate right now in the world is somewhere around 100%, okay? Like you're, you're going to die and it's... Life is not going to be easy. And maybe for you, the discouragement is like, man, you, you're like, I cannot take another hit. It's kind of, if you've ever played baseball or really any sport, talk about having a short memory. Because if you, have a, if you dwell on your last mistake, it's like the ball finds you. And, and you just keep making errors. And life's like that, man. It's like, ooh, I see a weak spot. I'm, I'm going to kick them when they get down. I'm going to stomp them. 
I got them on the ropes. And you get discouraged. Or you can get distracted. Or you've wandered and drifted because we never drift in the right direction. And you're disoriented. But then for some of us, if you stay discouraged long enough in your faith, then we just walk away. We begin to dismantle. Like, man, I, I don't need this. Like, I, you know what? Th this is, I, I thought, you know, I was, I was sold, you know, some, some snake oil, and, and like, this isn't, this isn't legit, this isn't real, and I, I'm just going to walk away from it all. And what we intended, how we thought it was going to go, doesn't go that way. And, and I would dare say that on all of our campuses, that, that if not in one of those right now, distracted, discouraged, disoriented, or in the process of dismantling your faith, deconstructing it and walking away, you've probably been in one of those situations before. And so this morning, what I want to do is, is I want to look at five promises I know it's a lot, a lot of promises to think about, but they're, they're easy. They're, they're, in fact, if you've been in church a long time, you're going to be like, man, I got up and got you know, my kids here for this. And but at the end of the day, and you know this about our faith, that it is not complicated. But that doesn't mean it's easy. And so these promises, I want to be like guides on, on our path. Or I'll give you another example of what these promises what I want them to be for you is uh, my, my son and I just recently, about three weeks ago, we were in Colorado and we were doing some hiking and some mountaineering and, and, and he saw something really for the first time that he'd never seen before and, and that is something called a rock cairn. Now, that's not cairn with a K, okay? That's not the neighbor or the HOA, you know, president or, or anything like that and I just want to take a moment and say, if your name is Karen... I want to publicly apologize that your name has been hijacked because I, 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 no doubt you are a sweet, lovely lady. And because of one Karen, it only takes one, you know, but why couldn't they have done Susie or Lucy or Cindy, but they got Karen. So I apologize, but this is not that Karen. Okay. This is, this is Karen with a C, C-A-I-R-N. And it's basically, it's just a stack of rocks. All right, we've got, got a picture of it. You can, you can take a look. It's just a, a stack of rocks. And what, what you use them for is when, when you get above the tree line, when you get above the tree line, you can't really follow a trail because the terrain's too rough, it's rocky, uh, so a lot of times it's too steep. And so what, what we'll do is we'll take, uh, to, to designate the trail, we'll stack these rocks in a very intentional way because you, you, know, you can look at that and go, well, a bear didn't do that, and they didn't just land there. And so it, it, what, they, what we use them for is to mark the direction, to orient yourself as, as to, to where you're going. And what I want for, for us this morning, as we look at these promises, I want these to be rock cairns for you, that when you find yourself in a place and you're just distracted, you're like, man, I, I don't even know how I got here. You're disoriented. You're discouraged. Man, life has beaten me down. I feel like God has forgotten about me. You can look at these promises because for us on the side of that mountain, as we're, we're scrambling, we're like, okay, everything looks like rock. Oh, there's a rock cairn over there. Let's go this way. There's the next one. And they would keep us moving in the right direction. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 6. We're going to be in the narrative of, of the Israelites who are in Egypt. And uh, you know, we sang a song about it earlier and if, you, if you're wondering, or maybe you're not familiar with the story, and that's okay, well, I'm going to bring you up to speed. And you're like, well, how did the Israelites get into slavery? Let's go through like 200 years of history, in, uh, I hope, in less than a minute, okay? Unless I get sidetracked, distracted. Uh, here, here's how, how it started. God comes to a man named Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Your offspring are going to be as, as many as the, uh, the stars in the sky, the sand on the beach. And Abraham is really old, and so is his wife. He's like, well, that's, that's okay. And, and so they have one son. His name's Isaac. 
Uh, Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob has a bunch of sons. One of them, his name is Joseph, and he is the favorite. And because he is the favorite, uh, all the other brothers not only just like him, they, they hate him. And so eventually they, they, they throw him in the pit, and they're like, hey, that, we probably shouldn't do that. You know, we don't want to kill him. Let, let's, let's sell him. Like, let's don't waste a little brother, right? And so let's, let's sell him. So they sell him uh, to some guys that are coming through. He ends up in Egypt working for a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar's got a wife that, that's a little wild. She comes on to Joseph. Joseph's like, hey, not, not about that. And, and eventually she accuses him of, of taking advantage of her. He gets thrown in prison. He's innocent, gets thrown in prison. Uh, two other guys get thrown in prison. He helps them get out. And he's like, hey, when you get out, remember me. Well, guess what they did? They forgot him. So he stayed down there for a long time. And then uh, one of the guys remembers him, brings him back up. He impresses Pharaoh. God, at all, during all of this, is with him and, and orchestrating this and giving him favor. Ends up being second in command in Egypt, all right? And there's a famine. Joseph hadn't seen his brothers for a really long time. He goes and, and they come looking for food. They don't know it's him. And he's walking like an Egyptian, talking like an Egyptian, all the things like an Egyptian. And they don't recognize it's him. And then they, when they finally do, you know, they're scared. And he said, no, no, I forgive you. You guys come and, and live here. And that's where the nation of Israel begins. And then hundreds of years go by, Pharaoh dies, Joseph dies, a new Pharaoh comes into play, and, and he doesn't know any of the history or care about the history, and he sees all of these Israelites who, who are multiplying. And he's like, man, we got to do something about these people because they are going to overtake us. If they decide to, you know, to, to take a run at me, I don't know that we can stop them. And so they enslave them, they oppress them, they put them into slavery. And they're that way for, for hundreds of years. Then God comes to a guy named Moses, okay? God talks to, uh, to Moses through a burning bush that doesn't burn up. That's why you don't do drugs. Just read your Bible. Moses is out on a mountain. He's doing his thing. Bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. God starts talking to him. You're on holy ground. Take your shoes off. Yes, sir. And, and he gets his message. And he, then he begins this journey of delivering God's people out of Egypt, out of slavery. But before he does that, God gives him five promises. One of the promises, the last one we've already talked about, I'm just going to point you back to that at the end. But the first four, I want to serve as rock carrings for you. That when you feel distracted, disoriented, discouraged, or in a place of wanting to dismantle and just walk away, that you can find that and go, no, 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 no. That's the way. That's the way to go. So Exodus chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 5. I'm going to read through this, and we're going to break them down. And we'll look at the promise that God made them and what that means for us. And, and, and just, this is just a, so you know, all of what we're about to say in the, in the story of the Exodus is foreshadowing what Jesus does for us and why these promises are true for us. Now, uh, starting in verse 5. Uh, it says, I have heard, moreover, I've heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I, and I have remembered my covenant. Now, I started in verse 5 because this is really important. It really serves as the foundation for these promises. He says, I have heard. In a few chapters prior, he tells Moses, I have seen. And oftentimes when we're in those places where we feel those things, man, we're like, man, God doesn't even see me. Or maybe sometimes we don't want God to see us. But he says, I, I see them, and I hear them, and, and I'm going to act. And here he goes, verse 6, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgments. I will, judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, verse 8, and I will bring you to the land I swore with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember those guys. Five promises, five I will statements that God says he's going to do. The first one he says, I'm going to, this is to the Israelites, I'm going to bring you out. He says, I'm going to bring you out. Oh, that, that makes sense. They're, they're enslaved, and, and God, God sees them. He hears them. But here's the question. What had the Israelites done for God to initiate that plan? Nothing. 
They didn't earn God's rescue. They didn't earn God's salvation. They didn't, they didn't do any of that. No. God just loved them and saw them right where they were and stepped in to rescue. The promise for us is that God sees you and loves you right where you are. This is why I love our church. The church for the unchurched. You don't have to clean up before you show up. People all the time talk about Christians being jacked up. Yeah, we are. That's why we're here. We don't have to clean up before we show up. That He says, I, I see you and I love you right where you are. And when you're in a place and you've gotten distracted and you've wondered, again, sometimes we don't wonder if God sees us. We hope he doesn't see us because he'll never take me back. And the promise that we cling to is in that moment, God says, no, 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 no. I love you right there in the midst of the mess that you made. And so he says, I, I love you right where you are. It's the first rock, Karen, that when you find yourself wandering in the wilderness, you can go, no, 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 that's the way. God, God loves me. Not because of anything I've done, but because he chooses to. The second thing he says, I will, he says, I will, I will bring you out. And then he says, I will free you from being slaves to them. And so that kind of sounds like the same thing. I'll bring you out and I'll free you. But the best way to say this is it's one thing to get the Israelites out of Egypt. It's a whole other ball game to get Egypt out of the Israelites. And so he says, listen, I, I'm, I'm not only am I going to, to, to get you out of that mess, but I'm going to get that mess out of, out of you. And it was a process. This, this may make sense for the first time in your life. If you've ever tried to read through the Bible in a year and you got to Leviticus, you're like, I'm done. You're like, what is God's deal? Like 600 plus rules? I mean, about everything. God had two, two reasons for doing that. Number one, he wanted his people to look radically different than any other nation of people on the planet. The second one is, is God knew that they didn't know how to live as free people. In fact, they hadn't even gotten all the way out of Egypt, and a bunch of them are complaining. And they're going, Moses, why would you bring us out here to die? Were there not enough graves in Egypt? We'd rather go back. Multiple times they did that. They didn't know how to live as free people. And so God gave them these rules, these parameters, these guidelines to, to shape them and show them how to experience true freedom. So the, the, the promise for us is that not only does God, like, save us, but he doesn't just secure heaven for us and go, like, hey, next 75, 80 years or 50, 60 years, good luck. Have fun. No. God desires to work in you. That's the promise. That God doesn't want to leave you to your own devices and just say, well, you figure it out. But, 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 but he, he works in you. He wants to. Even, even in the messes that we make, God is desiring to work in us. And again, we've, we come back to those, those four Ds of being distracted or, or distraught or, or, or discouraged, disoriented. And we're like, man, I, I don't know... I, I, I don't know if God can use any of this. I mean, look what all I've done. Look at the, look at the, the, the wake of destruction behind me. And God says, no, 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 no. I want to work in you if you'll let me. And he says, I'm going to get Egypt out of you. And here's the reality. Like the Egyptians had been in slavery for multiple generations. So that's all they'd known. Like literally, they did not know how to do anything for themselves. We're not that different. I mean, humanity as a whole, broad stroke, you may be the exception. Humanity as a whole, I mean, we have a knack for taking good gifts from a heavenly father and wrecking them. I mean, I'll just give you two examples, food and sex. I mean, like something that, that was given as a gift within God's parameters. And, and man, we, like you give me a bowl of ice cream, a quart of ice cream, it's, it, there's no, like, I'll just take a few bites. And we wreck it. 
There, there was a statement I heard years ago, probably about almost 25 years ago. It says that ultimate freedom is found under God's authority. And, and, and as a, a 20-something, when I heard that, immediately I'm thinking about rebellion because I, that's what I'm wired for. I have almost died too many times attempting to do things that people said I can't do. That was the only reason. Like, I, I, am, I am a rebel to my core. Like, that's, you give me a rule, and I'm going, hmm, gave me an idea. And so I always process that through, if I submit to God's authority, then, then I'll experience freedom. But, but in, in, in 2024, it's not really about rebellion. It's about feelings. That, that, that my feelings are, are, are the way to freedom. That if I feel it, then I should act on it and I'll experience freedom. And probably it's, a lot of us have acted on some feelings. And, and we didn't end up in freedom. But God desires that. And as we submit to him, we find that. He keeps going. He says, I will take you as my own people. Or excuse me, let me go back up. He says, I will free you from being slaves in them. And he says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. This word redeem is the same way we use the word reclaim, that, that, you, uh, that they had a, pur a purpose. God had a purpose for them that wasn't slavery. They were going to be the nation that brought the, the Savior to the world. He reclaimed them to use them for his purpose. The promise for us is, is that God, God has a unique purpose for each of us. You feel like you're wandering. You feel like you're drifting. You feel like you're in a place where you want to dismantle your faith. You're like, I, I, man, I, this is all fool's gold. And, and, and God's like, no, no, no. Look up here at this rock can right here. I have a purpose for you as uniquely as you are created. And there's not another one of you on this planet, nor will there ever be. I have a purpose just as unique. It's a promise. God loves me right where I am. I don't, I don't have to hide. He already sees me. God, God, God has a purpose for me. He wants to work in me in, in the mess, in the hard things, in the things I bring on myself, on the things that happen just because I live in this broken world. And then the last, or not the last one, the fourth one, he says this, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. He's like, I'm with you. Wherever you go, I'm there. Pretty much from here on out, when God talks to the Israelites, he says, I am the Lord, your God. Previously, he said, I'm the Lord God. If you flip over in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, the apostle Paul He's talking about the love of God, and he goes on. And he's making these, these, these grand statements about how nothing can separate us from the love of God in your life or death or principalities. Or, you know, and he goes back and forth, back and forth. Then he asks the question, who can separate us from God's love? No one can. He said, it's the analogy of no matter for my son, no matter where he goes on this planet, He will always be my son. His circumstances don't change that. His location doesn't change that. His behavior doesn't change that. And God is saying, I'm with you. I'm never going to leave you. And the last one, he simply says, hey, I'm going to bring you to the land I swore with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That's what Blake talked about a couple weeks ago, about living in the already, not yet. And, and, and the, the promise for us is that, is that this place is not home. And if you missed that message, you need to go back and listen to it. But that is a promise. What we experience on this planet 
is temporary. But there is a place that has been secured and waiting. There'll be no tears, there'll be no pain, there'll be no suffering. And we look in our life and we begin to, to, to identify these, these rock Karens and go, okay, like, I'm a, little, I'm a little lost right now. I've wandered, I've drifted, but I know that God has a purpose for me. I know he does. I know I'm not just using good air. And that's my only purpose. You find yourself in a place of, of sin in your life and, and it has, maybe, maybe you started out being curious and it, it has overwhelmed you. And God, I, I gotta figure this thing out before, before I show back up to house church, before I show back up to church, before I you know, get back around those people, before I put myself in the presence of God. No, God sees you right where you are and loves you still. But oh, great, I, I've, I've got to, I've got to, I got to figure all this out. I got to get, I got to get all my questions answered. I mean, hey, God's, God's working in you. It's okay. You are a, a work in process. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will see it to completion. He being God working in us. I don't know, man. There's, there's so much that's happened to me. I've been burned by Christians. I've been burned by churches. I've, you know, uh, I've, people have oversold and underdelivered uh, for, for Jesus. There's too much garbage that I've had to deal with. Maybe, maybe all of this, again, is just fool's gold. And God is saying, no, I've got a purpose for you. I can, I can redeem all of that. I can reclaim every single bit of it. None of it has to be wasted. I see you. I, I, I love you in the midst of you wanting to dismantle your faith. I love you in that. Ask the hard questions. Wrestle with them. Let me walk alongside you because I want to work in you. Vacations rarely go as they're planned. Life, faith rarely go as planned. We've got some promises to hang on to. They're not deep. They're simple. But they're life altering. And just like for my son out on those mountains, and we're like, I, I don't know where we should go. There's a rock here and right there. Let's go there. Let's, let's go there. Then we'll, we'll, we'll pick up another one. We'll find the next one. We find ourselves back on track. I'm going to pray for us. And in the next few moments, I'm going to challenge you on all of our campuses. One, just to sit in these promises and understand kind of which one that you need to claim. And maybe do a survey of your life and say, are you, are you distracted right now? Are you discouraged? Are you, are you a little bit of all of them? And then claim that promise. Maybe you need to come to the cross and part of that is leaving a sin that has distracted you. Maybe it's just reprioritizing. But we want you to respond to what God's doing in your life and the promises that he's made us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you that you love us where we are. You love us too much to leave us there. You give us a purpose and a plan that ultimately brings fulfillment to us and honors you. And that God, no matter how bad things get on this planet, this place is not our home. God, help us to cling to those promises this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.